Hi everybody, it's Brian Strausser, Principal and Chief Executive here at BrightPath. And I'm gonna be walking through a presentation I did earlier this year at the Secure360 conference on business continuity begins with strategy. In this presentation, I hope that you walk away with a better understanding of how to more align your business continuity or overall resilience program with your organization's strategic objectives, the strategy of your organization, and hopefully help you gain more credibility uh, and buy-in for your program. By way of background, I have been uh, in the resilience space for about 30 years. Uh, I previously worked at a large retailer where I built and led their business continuity, crisis management, crisis communications, and resilience program. And I started Bright Path a little over a decade ago where we really work with the world's leading brands to strategically manage and navigate uncertainty and disruption. The challenge I see around strategy with business continuity is this, that we don't have a good strategy understanding as business continuity professionals, and that there is a theme to common challenges that I see in business continuity. I hear things like, my company is filled with silo-based thinking and I can't get any traction, uh, that I hear all the time from resilience leaders that they can't get any time with senior executives, I hear about getting turned down for requests for resources and headcount and software and budget. Um, I hear about being surprised by strategic announcements within the organization. And I hear people frustrated with not understanding why they don't get called upon to give updates in company meetings or uh, during major disruptions in the organization. And I really think this was illustrated quite strongly during COVID, where in our own experience in working with dozens of Fortune 500 clients, that in most organizations, the resilience leader for the organization was not leading the overall organizational effort around COVID. That instead, companies turned to a senior executives that had more experience leading organization-wide initiatives. And in some organizations, business continuity and even crisis management or emergency management, they were simply not involved in the COVID response beyond the tactical work in their silo supporting the strategic initiative. And I walked away from that really wanting to understand why it was that that's what was going on, that they weren't, why were those of us in this profession not at the forefront of leading this for organizations? McKinsey said uh, as well in their own study of the COVID-19 pandemic that coming out of the pandemic, that there's been no greater concern to the C-suite than the next major disruption on the horizon. So why is it that resilience leaders were sidelined? Well, I believe, and we have seen in our work, that strategic misalignment is really at the core of this challenge. First, that resilience leaders don't understand company or corporate strategy. Um, business continuity itself is a highly focused, highly process focused effort. We execute a life cycle, we complete the BIA, we update your plan, and we report on program performance. Your organization has developed an overarching strategy for the organization, and we fail to align our efforts and connect our efforts to that strategy. And also that resilience leaders, to be honest, are often focused in areas that are just not perceived to be important. Um, we sometimes work or focus on overly complex, little understood processes. There's a lack of perceived value in the work required to make a program successful. And there's a lack of support or lack of involvement in strategic initiatives that comes from business continuity uh, and resilience professionals. So I would ask you this question for you to consider, and that is what is on your CEO's mind today about resilience? And what's on their mind about your business, about the overall business in your organization? Probably not much about resilience, to be honest. And if they are thinking about resilience, are they thinking about your function? Are they thinking about the work that you and your team do? I'll give you a simple story. I've, I've told this in some other settings before, but when I was interviewing to take over a combined business continuity, crisis management, resilience function uh, in the last major company that I worked at, 
Um, I had an interview with the CEO. This was the final interview for someone at my level. And we uh, sat down in his office, uh, you know, in kind of a more casual setting, a couch and some chairs. And uh, I think we had 20 minutes. And he just looked at me and goes, help me understand, Brian, uh, why, why is this stuff important? Like, why do I give a shit about business continuity? Because I don't, he's like, honestly, I don't understand why we do all this. And I said, well, did you, did you look at the Wall Street Journal today? And he goes, yes. And I said, you read the story on the cover page of the Wall Street Journal about the potential labor strikes in China and the disruption that they were uh, potentially going to experience with freight. Yes. And you're aware, I'm sure, that 60, 70 percent of our merchandise comes from China. Yes. Did you know that our principal competitor has a side agreement that would exempt them and their freight from any such labor disruption? No. That's why you need business continuity. That's why you need to invest in this space. And from there, we went into more of a regular interview conversation. But that's the kind of alignment and the kind of reasoning that an executive is looking for. What they're not looking for and what would not have worked in this situation is for me to say, well, you know, the ISO 22301 standard, which we try to follow here, says we should do X, Y, Z. He didn't care about that. He cares about the business problem. The business problem here was potential labor disruption that would have impacted the supply chain in China. So let's talk a little bit about strategy. When we talk about corporate strategy, uh, my favorite writer on this topic is uh, Roger Martin, a former dean of the Rotman School of Business in Toronto. And Roger, uh, Dr. Martin wrote that the two most fundamental strategic choices, the two most fundamental strategic choices a company makes is where to play and how to win. Where to play being what's the business we're going to be in. And once we've made that decision, then the second strategic question is how do we win? How do we differentiate ourselves from our competition? Your company has asked itself some similar questions about where to play and how to win, whether you recognize that or not. We often see strategy expressed at a strategic level in the organization. Uh, in terms of a strategy map, this is one example of what that could look like. Different companies approach this differently, but you probably have something like this in your organization that would help you understand the value proposition your company is really going after and how do they structure themselves to do so. One of our clients uh, originally, uh, when we started working with them, they did shine trees, which is another way of kind of laying this out in more of a tree diagram. You can look this up. But it's another way of thinking about a strategy map and how to think about that, uh, a simple way of expressing the strategy that your organization is trying to follow. So with that in mind, how can we get better alignment between your resilience function and the strategies of your organization? Well, it starts with understanding how your business works. How does your business make money? What are their core operations? And as business continuity leaders, you know, this is something that I would expect that you have a good understanding of. Um, but you want to learn and understand the overall business of your organization. And one of the best ways to do that, uh, my favorite way of, of understanding this, is just to go out and talk to people and find out what's going on and find out what is on their minds. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. But visiting with leaders, visiting sites, if that's a thing in your organization, looking around your corporate intranet or SharePoint sites, it's going to meetings in other parts of the organization and listening to their story and presenting your story to them. Uh, and again, it's with just talking to people and getting out of your cubicle or getting out of the team's meeting and go have these conversations. I'll give you an example just recently uh, in related, uh, related to change healthcare, but uh, you know, one of our, uh, several of our clients were impacted in the change healthcare breach. And in each of these, uh, as they were relating what they had learned, one of the questions I asked is, you know, what's your relationship with change? Like, are they a direct vendor? Were you depending on things with them? Um, so therefore I would expect to see them in BIAs, for example, as a vendor. Uh, or as a, some kind of service provider uh, documented as a dependency. Um, but, you know, what else was the, what was that relationship? Where were you surprised by some of this uh, dependency? And almost all of them had examples of things they didn't know. And part of it was that some of them just couldn't answer the question. 
uh, because they didn't have a good BC program in place, or they just didn't know, like couldn't articulate to me how their company interfaced with change. They just knew that change was disrupted and therefore they had some disruption because of that. So that's a good example of where there's misalignment because you don't know how your own company works. So we want to make sure that we have a good understanding of that. When it comes to this kind of alignment, I like to remind everybody that relationships really matter. And that's something that we discount sometimes, I think, in the resilience space. In order to build this knowledge and understand how your company works, you've got to get out of your cubicle or Microsoft Teams or Zoom or however you're doing your meetings and go and talk with the team. Go and meet with them and learn what it is that they're doing. I challenge resilience leaders a lot to go talk to their business partners and stakeholders and find out what they think. I like to ask questions like, what are some challenges you're currently faced with in your area of responsibility? What are some major initiatives going on in your area? What's your perception of the business continuity team? For example, when my team calls you, do you think, oh, I am so excited to talk to my partners in business continuity because I know they will help me? Or is it like, Jesus, I got to talk with them again. Every time I talk to them, it's four hours of busy work. What's that perception of your team? What have your interactions been like with our team? Do you feel that our team understands your area of the business? What are some things that keep you up at night in terms of disruptions or crisis situations? Do you feel like those things are being addressed within the organization? And do you have any other critical feedback on how we might be better partners for you and your team? Now, these are questions similar that we use, similar to the ones that we use when we're conducting a program evaluation, what we call a resiliency diagnosis. But when we go in to talk with a, uh, a company and its stakeholders about their business continuity team and capabilities, these are questions we ask and teams are often surprised by the answers. But you can go meet with your stakeholders and ask the same kinds of questions to understand how good of a business partner are you and your team to your stakeholders and what's the perception of your team that's out there? And I would encourage you to ask these questions and listen carefully and not challenge. Maybe ask for examples, but not challenge the perception, but listen to what that is. And then ask yourself how you got to where you are and what could you change moving forward. I would challenge you as a resilience leader to think about the relationships that you do have in the organization. And I like to think about... Um, effectiveness of these relationships and how you need to really have game-changing relationships to be effective leading resilience and aligning that well with your company strategies. To me, the table stakes of a resilience leader and their relationships is that they're regularly talking with the chief information security officer, the head of physical security or chief security officer, the DR leader, the audit leader, and the crisis leader, if they're not the crisis leader themselves. They add even more value if they have regular relationship conversations with communications, compliance, ERM, their peers elsewhere in the industry, uh, the chief HR officer, the CIO, and the CFO. But the real differentiators, the resilience leaders that I see being the best aligned and the most effective in their organization are ones that have a relationship with the CEO, with their audit or risk committee, or you may call it something else. Um, the leaders of your business units, your partners in the public sector, um, other executives not mentioned here, and the leaders of key third-party stakeholders. Those are the differentiators that set aside um, a resilience leader's alignment and effectiveness, in my mind, just thinking about relationships. Marketing and awareness plays a part in this as well. Thinking about how you can tell the story of your program in the organization because you want to demystify what's happening. You want to show the value that your organization, your program creates to the company by making it more resilient. You can write articles for your corporate intranet. You can have town hall meetings or internal webinars. You can go on a roadshow and present at different team meetings in the organization. You can create posters or digital signing if you're still in the office. Um, but never, ever underestimate the power of branding these things and how you can use that effectively. One of our clients, Athena Health, has done a very good job of branding their program as Athena Resilience. That's kind of a typical a nomenclature they use uh, inside of their organization. And one of their themes is that all Athenistas have a role to play in Athena Resilience. No matter what you do, 
you have a role to make sure that your client's work is not disrupted. And as a healthcare technology provider, that resonates well with their employees. At the end of the day, your organization's, your team strategy rather, needs to ladder up to your organization's overall business objectives and risks. You want, in explaining this, you want to avoid the field specific terminology, the rocket science that we all feel like we have to speak and just use plain language. BIA, BCP, CMT, business impact analysis, business continuity plan, crisis management team, just use the plain language as best you can. And you should never ever miss an opportunity to explain that, uh, to demonstrate and explain that alignment to any audience in your organization that would listen to you. For example, if you have a GSOC, a Global Security Operations Center, and that's part of your area of responsibility, you've got a really cool thing that people will want to see. So bring them there, show off your capabilities, and tell your story. They'll think it's cool, trust me. I want to take you through a little bit of a strategic exercise uh, here, and that is to use COVID as an example of how strategies have had to change. We all know that during the pandemic, we had to make immediate changes in response to the crisis. Companies changed their operating model. We repurposed teams. We had to implement physical distancing, masking, and other uh, proactive uh, measures to make sure that people were safe. These were great lessons in crisis management, but they were kind of fleeting changes because as the pandemic evolved and receded, some of these things we clawed back. But there have been permanent changes as well. Day-to-day -day work has changed in ways both good and bad, mostly for good. But the pandemic uh, forced acceleration, uh, an accelerated adoption of trends that were already happening, particularly around remote and hybrid work, um, around digital collaboration and the tools that make that work. And it's empowered some transformative automation with AI and machine learning. In many ways, these were things that we thought prior to the pandemic were just too ambitious. Um, but the pandemic made these key to survival, and a lot of companies implemented these very quickly. It has forced a new way of working. Um, it's forced, it forced leaders to make some hard decisions and adapt to new behaviors. These included new team structures, new rules or ways of leading hybrid and remote teams. It required investing in the right collaboration technologies and processes. It required us to really be always on because we were working from home and those lines got really blurred even though they were blurred before, now they're really blurred. Tighter and different productivity rules, and we had new working and operating models that just didn't exist before. And then a lot of companies have started to ask the question, even three years ago, do we need all this real estate still? And a lot of our clients have dumped a significant amount of real estate and have really downsized their footprint because they didn't need the office space anymore. So think about all of the changes that, that the pandemic and the things you learned from that what that did to business continuity and crisis management, how it forced you to think differently and do things in a different way. I'll give you some, own, some examples from just our world for us here at Bright Path. Prior to the pandemic, we never conducted a full tabletop exercise remotely. We always did those in person. Now we almost always do them fully remotely. Uh, we have clients that we've never done an in-person exercise for. And in fact, uh, we had a client that we went to their office to do the exercise, and the only people in the room were ourselves and the chief security officer. Everyone else participated from home or from a different office location. We have had engagements that have been fully remote with people that we have never, ever met in person. Um, as I say here, we have nearly a dozen clients we've never met in person, but we have built their entire business continuity and crisis management program for them and done it all remotely. It has been and it has led to a complete shift in how we think now about planning for the loss of a facility um, because for most businesses, if you're not in manufacturing and you're not in healthcare delivery uh, and you're not running a retail store, uh, you don't need that facility um, because you're not moving anything. You're not doing hands-on work. You're doing knowledge work and you can do that from home or from some other site. So it has changed how we used to think about one of the biggest areas we used to plan around for business continuity, and that was loss of a site. It's caused us to reimagine the physical space, uh, thinking about office layout and collaboration in a different way. 
It's caused us to think about managing the needs of our teams and their mental health differently than before. Um, companies have reported generally increased productivity, particularly once the new digital collaboration tools have caught up with the need that they had. Um, we, of course, find that remote employees have difficulty staying connected with colleagues and managing work-life boundaries, and I think we're all still learning about that. And again, leaders with remote and hybrid teams have to find some different ways to collaborate and communicate to help bridge that gap. And of course, this has opened up a totally different view of how to think about talent uh, and how we can use automation and artificial intelligence, ChatGPT, uh, for example, or Google Bard and others uh, as examples of this. AI continues to be an area of focus and McKinsey has put out a lot of information around uh, the impact that they're seeing and how much of a demand and impact on the workforce that they expect to see in the coming years. So when we summarize the future of work, uh, COVID really flattened the cultural and technological barriers that stood in the way of remote and distributed work. It created new rule sets for leaders where we manage to the output rather than the effort and we have to learn to manage remotely rather than butts and seats where I can see what they're doing. Um, leadership as well were required, will require more technologically enabled practices than before. Uh, and then I'll note, of course, that just over half of the workforce really has little to no opportunity for remote work. They're in healthcare, uh, on-site manufacturing, specialized uh, machinery, where you have to be there in order to do the work. Keys to success in this new world include um, expanding focus on clearly explaining uh, strategy, so strategic clarity, coaching, and empathy. Um, the most important thing that we see in terms of retaining talent is the sense of purpose that work provides to the team. Um, and it has forced leaders to be more intentional about uh, interactions and collaboration. With small cross-functional teams, and this is the way to get the best results, is to really foster outcome-based management of those teams. So this is less about controlling the work, the butts and seats idea, and more about setting clear goals and then empowering the teams and the people on them to perform and meet those goals. Um, increasing talent velocity, staffing teams across organizational silos, and that ability to cut across silos as an important skill set. Finding zero cost ways to collaborate, um, like having an informal confidential channel for banter, guidelines for meeting efficiency, and so on and so forth. And then just continuing to increase the rate of technology adoption. So if we were having this conversation in person, I would ask you to take all of that into, into account and then think about how that would change your resilience practices and work over the next decade. What's going to look different by 2034, 2035 than what you see today based on this discussion we've had here around strategy? So to wrap up briefly, I will tell you that I think there is no better time than the present to be a leader, to be an executive, uh, to be a manager or a practitioner in the resilient spaces of business continuity, crisis management, DR, infosec, physical security. Your executives right now are looking to be led on matters related to resilience. They're looking for you to help lead the organization forward. And I would challenge you to find ways to seize that opportunity. That's it for this presentation. Uh, if we can help you in any way, feel free to reach out to us at contact at brightpath.com. You can find more videos on our YouTube channel as well as shorts and our award-winning Managing Uncertainty podcast. Be well. Thanks for watching our video. To learn more about how to manage uncertainty and disruption in your organization, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe to our video channel. And here are a few more videos that we've selected that will help you learn more about business continuity, crisis management, and crisis communications.